Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give everybody just a minute to get into the room, and we will begin very shortly. Thanks for joining. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar today. I'm Jose Sogard, uh, Deputy Director for the Office of Nightlife. For those of you who don't know, we are a dedicated non-enforcement liaison between the city and the nightlife industry. We work to support businesses navigating city bureaucracy, improve quality of life relations between venues and residents, promote and protect nightlife culture and support creating safer spaces, which is what we are doing here today. If you have any issues or questions about your nightlife venue or space, uh, please always feel free to reach out to us directly at nightlife at media.nyc.gov. That email address is on the screen right now. And you can follow us on our social media accounts at nycnightlife.gov. So today's webinar is part of a new series of courses uh, that we've recently created called Night School, or Nightlife Industry Training and Education, which will be held both uh, virtually and in person. This is a series to share resources and trainings for owners, workers, and patrons in the nightlife community, addressing how best to engage with city agencies, opening and operating nightlife businesses, proactive harm reduction tools, quality of life issues, and a lot more. So you can find out more information at nyc.gov slash night school. That's N-I-T-E school. And uh, we will put that link in the chat as well. So the safety and well-being of the nightlife community is a top priority for our office. And we know that uh, nightlife are places where people look out for each other, and we can all do our part to help create safer spaces in our venues. Uh, the webinar today will feature a presentation from Outsmart NYC, which is a crisis prevention and bystander intervention program that works with nightlife venues to train your staff to help prevent sexual harassment and other crisis situations. We're very excited to partner with them to help bring you some tools and tips today and learn how to work with them to give your staff some additional training to recognize and respond to incidents in your venue should they occur. Just a quick disclaimer, um, as is often the case when we are talking about health and safety issues in nightlife, uh, we want to make sure to note that these incidents, unfortunately, can and do happen in many different kinds of settings. It's not just a nightlife specific issue. We're not targeting nightlife, um, but we want you to have the tools and resources that you need um, and to be as prepared as possible when you're out at night or wherever else you are. Before we get to the training, I uh, just want to add a, a quick additional housekeeping note. Um, you can use the Q&A feature in the Zoom to let us know your questions throughout the meeting, and we've also enabled the chat for today. Uh, after the presentation, we'll uh, have some time for Q&A and hopefully a little bit of discussion. In addition to today's training, I'm also happy to be joined by my colleague from the NYC Commission on Gender Equity, uh, Sarah milner Barry. Uh, she is the Program and Policy Analyst in the Public Safety Unit at CEGE, and she is here to share a couple brief updates on their work, um, as well as some info about a really important campaign that is currently underway right now. So thanks for joining us, Sarah. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, and it's really lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as Jose mentioned, uh, I am the Policy and Program Analyst for Safety at the Commission on Gender Equity. Um, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, so I just wanted to give a very brief kind of blurb about the Commission on Gender Equity in case folks are not familiar um, with what we do. So we are a mayoral office who are dedicated to uh, dismantling equity barriers across New York City, 
that face girls, women, intersex, transgender, gender non-binary, and gender non-conforming people. Uh, we have three areas of focus. So I work uh, on our safety portfolio. We also have a health and reproductive justice portfolio, as well as an economic mobility and opportunity portfolio. So one of the ways that we do our work is uh, cross-sector and interagency collaboration, which is how I'm able to be here today presenting. Um, obviously the safety portfolio intersects with the work that you all are doing here today. Um, and in particular, we are now in the midst of our 16 days of activism against gender-based violence campaign that the city has been participating in since 2014, so a couple of years, um, but we really wanna you know, try to expand this year um, we have some in-person events going on, um, and we have dedicated a new city website to the campaign. So I'm just going to share a little bit about the 16 Days campaign um, and how you all can get involved in it. Um, before I do that, I should say that we lead this campaign with the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, NGBV, um, and with the Mayor's Office of Equity. So this is sort of a multi-agency um, campaign. And I know that my colleagues at NGBV wanted to be here. Um, and I am gonna share a little bit uh, on their behalf. So um, before I talk about it, I just wanna give a, a brief uh, definition of gender-based violence. I'm sure you, know, you all are um, aware, but gender-based violence is um, emotional, physical, verbal, sexual, economic, or structural abuse that is rooted in exploiting unequal power relationships between genders. So it shows up in a number, um, you know, many, many different ways from human trafficking, to female genital cutting, to domestic violence. Um, so it's it's really wide ranging and it's really impacting all of our communities across New York City and across the country. Um, so as part of this campaign, we hold events, we do uh, outreach, community gathering, educational materials, and we promote the resources that the city operates for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence. So those are the family justice centers that are um, in each of the five boroughs across the city that our colleagues at NGBV operate. Um, so there are a lot of events um, that are taking place. The campaign began on November 25th. It goes till December 10th. Um, so in the next couple of days, there are panels. Um, there is a, a live reading of a play that is focused on domestic violence. There's a VR exhibit. Um, there's also a couple of bystander intervention trainings actually operated by um, our partners at right to be So those are public, they're free, they're open to anyone. Um, you can access and sign up for those events on the website, which is nyc.gov slash 16 days. I will drop it in the chat for you. Um, and outside of those events, uh, on the website, you'll also find kind of social media assets, our toolkit, which provides more information on gender-based violence and what you can do to prevent it, um, as well as resources. So I think that's all I have, but please reach out to me with any questions. Um, I will drop my email and that website, and I'm so happy to be here and looking forward to this training. Thank you all so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm really excited to see that campaign and, uh, and the impact that it's making. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's training. Um, this will be conducted by our partners who are part of the Outsmart NYC partnership. Uh, first, we have Eric McGriff, who is the prevention coordinator at the Crime Victims Treatment Center, or CVTC. Uh, Amy Northup is the nightlife community liaison, also at CVTC. And Scarlett Thompson is the prevention coordinator at the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. So thank you so much, all three of you, for being with us, uh, Eric, Amy, and Scarlett. So take it away. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen really quickly, and we will get into it. Okay, slideshow. Here we go. Amy, you want to you wanna kick us off? Sure. You're um, driving the slides, right? Is that yes. technology? It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Also, um, we just got um, wonderful intros from Jose. Thank you. Um, as he mentioned, I am the nightlife community liaison. I am one of two on our team right now. Jasmine is also here somewhere, uh, just not on the panel today, but you may know Jasmine as DJ Nina Vicious. She's the best. Um, our other uh, half of the nightlife community team. Um, and then we have Eric and we have Scarlett. 
So you you can skip to the next slide here. You'll notice that we are very specifically a partnership between industries. Um, we are not just prevention coordinators, therapists, preventionists, and we are not just nightlife professionals, bartenders, owners, managers. Um, we really believe in the partnership of that. So you can see here some of the people in the past or present who have partnered with us, CVTC, who uh, Eric and I work for, New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault, who Scarlet works for. Um, we also have partners or have had partners at Mount Sinai, Brooklyn Allied Bars and Restaurants, and the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Um, and we work together to address sexual violence in nightlife and hospitality. All right, Sean. So just a little bit of information about our history. Um, Outsmart is really supported a lot by funds that come directly, well, come from the Department of Health, by from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. In 2007, they started committing more funding to community level approaches to preventing violence. Uh, if you don't know, the CDC addresses violence very much like it does address diseases and COVID um, and everything. So we use some of their models. Um, we worked with Project Envision at Mount Sinai Beth Israel Victim Services and with um, Outsmart BK, Dave Rosen, Brooklyn Allied Bars and Restaurants, who already had campaigns started on the ground to work with the New York City nightlife and hospitality industry. Uh, for us, about 10 years ago, we as victim service providers at the Crime Victims Treatment Center noticed an uptick in nightlife sexual assaults. And because we currently work on task forces with the NYPD, with the hospitals, with other nonprofits that provide resources most victims go to, because most victims don't go to the police, they don't go to the EEOC or to the state, right? We used our information to develop a curriculum that we thought would help bridge the gap and meet the needs of survivors in nightlife and hospitality spaces. And our approach is like, we know stuff is going to happen that you don't have control over. So we're going to help you all identify options before harm happens. We're gonna help you intervene in moments when harm is escalating or right after it happens. But we're also going to help you after harm happens because we know there are a lot, you might not be there, you might freeze, you might be afraid, you might not know what to do. So even in those moments, that's why we're here to help you create a referral. Send someone to someone like us who can believe your survivor if you aren't able to say, I believe you, especially when it's an employee. Um, so we provide a lot of different supports. And since our, create our creation, um, we've collaborated with a lot of venues. We've worked with about 80 venues uh, to provide training um, and even more to provide support, events, campaigns. Uh, we're gonna get more into that later. Thank you, Eric and Amy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our mission, uh, which again, we'll kind of we're kind of breezing through all this more like, you know, informational stuff, and then we're going to get into some tips and tricks later. Um, but our mission, like has kind of been stated, we really want to empower nightlife folks to prevent and respond to sexual violence. So a couple different components of that. Education and training kind of go hand in hand. We have a whole slide dedicated to what we can offer you. So hold on tight for that. Um, but then another really big component is the community mobilization. So we work really closely with people who work in nightlife. Um, we host collective meetings. Um, we host just parties, times for nightlife folks to like share space and be in community together. Um, we work with some health equity consultants who are current nightlife workers who are absolutely amazing, helping us with our curriculum, the New York City Hospitality Alliance, just all these networks, because we know that change can't really happen unless it's coming from the community members and unless there's really a want and a need um, from the community itself. So that's really a core part of Outsmart. And then finally, expanding access to supportive services. So uh, Eric also kind of just mentioned this, but really, we recognize that not pretty much any nightlife establishments are necessarily going to have like a massive HR team, 15 people like coordinating all those human resource things that that really need to be taken care of in a workplace. So we try to step in where we can to offer people support services, get them connected to whether it's an advocate who can talk about an experience of sexual violence or help someone who's in a domestic violence situation, talk about immigration rights, like any any type of support services that people need, we we will connect them to. Okay. We believe. Amy, take it away. Okay. 
Um, I'm gonna go off the slide here a little bit too to just sort of add some stuff to this. But I mentioned earlier, um, the, well, let me talk about this. Okay, the nightlife and hospitality industries are uniquely positioned to be community leaders in preventing violence. I sort of believe that we're in a good place to be community leaders in any kind of culture change. Um, we're like the most un, on the ground with humanity of any other industry. People come to our jobs after they leave theirs um, and they come and they are kind of more their whole selves than when they leave their corporate nine to five HR structure places. So that is, um, yeah, I see a question there, absolutely. Uh, hold on, let me look at this. Let me read this. Who's we is in Nightlife Coalition Against Sexual Assault. So uh, when I'm saying we, I, I am speaking about Outsmart, which includes a coalition of nightlife professionals as well as um, the partners um, at, at, at CBTC and the Alliance, people like Eric and Scarlett. Um, I'm a longtime bartender, manager, I've worked in nightlife for 15 years. I also uh, work now predominantly actually as an intimacy coordinator in film and television. So I'm specifically kind of working, no, no, you're good, um, in experts that don't have sort of an HR structure or don't have a classic structure of workplace. There's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of different bosses coming in and out, the interactions between the staff um, and, you know, the, 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 um, the customers are really unique. So like we don't, we don't. We know that we can't uh, one size fit all. Copy and paste traditional um, prevention and harassment efforts from a corporate environment into an industry like nightlife. Um, so you can hit that next point, Scarlett. That will kind of lead us to this. So we believe that the industry profess professionals, nightlife professionals, are the experts in their spaces, and they deserve training and education that is tailored to that expertise. Uh, not only of their industry, but of their venue. We are really venue specific in the way that we approach our training. Um, I don't, I know from like years of being a bartender and all the different places I've worked that like that little HR video that you have to watch that's like sexual harassment day or as part of your onboarding. In my experience, it actually really makes things worse. It always escalates harassment in the workplace uh, for a couple of days after everybody has to watch it because it's a joke, because it be, it is so not applicable to the way that we work and the way that we have to interact and the way that we make our money that it almost kind of breeds this like, well, this doesn't apply to us, so we don't get to have it. We don't get to have um, boundaries in this industry. We don't get to have rights in this industry because this version doesn't apply to this. So we really seek to do better than that, to come in and say, yeah, we can do that. We can have that. It's just going to look a little bit different. Um, and it needs to be venue and culture specific. Um, we also, as you've heard me kind of talk about this, we definitely go beyond patron to patron. We know that we cannot talk about patron safety without it also acknowledging the harm that industry uh, workers experience from patrons, coworkers, systems, industry norms. Um, so we really include that in our training as well. Um, we believe in being reality-based about the work that we're doing. We are going to talk really realistically about the things that happen in your venues, what your space looks like, um, maybe some of the stuff that would be off limits to discuss in other spaces we're going to talk about. Um, and we really believe in meeting theory with practice. So we're going to come, you know, folks like Eric and Scarlett, who are experts in what works um, to prevent harm and violence, are going to meet people with the nightlife expertise that is on that team. Um, and we're going to talk about, okay, how does this actually, and you'll see this later, we'll demonstrate a little bit with some tips of like, okay, this is the tip that you would get at a, a bystander intervention training. This is how it applies to your venue. This is what it might look like on your staff. Um, what have I missed here? Scarlett, what did I not talk about yet? Oh, the sustainable culture change is possible when we build collaborative relationships between industries and their surrounding communities to address issues of violence and harm. Again, that's just speaking to the collaboration and the partnership that is core to who we are and what we do. And I think Scarlett covered this and expanding industry access to free, safe, supportive, and confidential services for survivors of violence. We recognize that um, it needs to go beyond HR um, and, and policing and that there are other, um, we just wanna make sure people know that those resources are actually there for this industry. So in terms of what resources, Outsmart can be like confusing for a lot of folks. There are a lot of options. There are a lot of ways that we customize our work to meet the specific needs of venues or communities. So we like to tell people, think of our services as a menu of options. 
for us, we know when you come to a survivor, the best thing to do is find ways to give them options and give them power as much as possible and letting them choose what happens next. So we do that here, right? We're gonna tell you about our services, the education and training, the community advocacy, the resources and support services. And we're gonna say, where can you start? What do you have time to do? Were there any recent crises that you have to respond to that are really urgent right now? What are the things your staff are interested in doing? And then we'll come to you as folks who are paid to do this work, like treat us like consultants. The cool thing is we come from a nonprofit structure. So for any New York City venue, we want, we're not going to charge you. We're just extra labor to help you provide the extra support that we know is not being provided a lot of the time to the industry or like folks don't know exists. Like at CVTC, again, a lot of folks don't know that you have free legal medical therapeutic services. Also, CVTC, my job, we are part of New York City's mass casualty response team. Right. So after large scale incidents um, like the ones we've been seeing in the news, our staff is prepared to help support you after those. Like we have contingencies for it. Um, so, yeah, we let you pick what you like and then we customize it to meet what you. Yeah, your needs. And then we hope that we will continue partnership as we go on. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so I'm going to dive into this a little bit more, like I said before. So again, this the purpose of what we're doing, where we're going today, we're giving you a little bit of information now about you know, what we can offer you. And then actually, as soon as the next slide, we're going to get into some actual activities that we do in the trainings, because we're assuming the folks who are on this webinar today are nightlife professionals, whether you're staff, uh, bartender, barback, management, owner. So we're tailoring this really to nightlife folks right now. Um, and so here are all the things that, you know, We'll have a slide at the end that tells you how to get in contact with us. Here are all the kind of things you can ask for in terms of training. So bystander intervention is obviously one of the biggest ones that we want to be talking about in sexual assault prevention in, in our world. Um, we have a very, you know, lengthy bystander intervention training. If somebody wants to really just focus on that part of prevention, happy to do that. But then we also have something like trauma 101 or supporting people who have been harmed, which we'll give a little sneak peek of later. Um, but really, this is about understanding what happens in the brain when somebody experiences sexual assault or other forms of harm. And what does it look like to provide a trauma informed response to that? Sexual violence 101. So also understanding why does harm happen? Like what harms are we actually talking about when we talk about sexual violence? Because we're not just talking about one very specific type of incident that many people like might picture when they hear sexual violence. We're talking about a spectrum of harm. So this is really understanding like why do people cause harm? What does that harm look like and how do we respond to it? Uh, continuing education. So this is actually, some of these have been on pause since COVID. I mean, a lot of things in the nightlife industry, I think, as we all know, were put on pause during COVID. But um, this is something we've done in the past that we're revamping next year, which is just a series of opportunities for any nightlife person to come to um, that are continuing education, whether you've gotten a training from us before or whether you want one in the future. So work like in the Engaging Men series with the Bartenders Guild, uh, harm reduction with the Drug Policy Alliance, or supporting LGBTQ plus communities with Thrive. Um, and then we have venue specific workshops. This is really like what we do, I would say, for the majority of the spaces that we go to. You reach out to us, we say, okay, what do you want to talk about? What are you seeing happening in your space? Um, what kind of skills does your staff want to be building? And we can pull from bystander intervention, trauma 101, sexual violence 101, all those things. And we make a workshop just for your space. And it can be however long or however short you need it to be, because also we know it's really hard to get a staff together for any extended period of time um, with nightlife folks. And then finally, this is what I'm very excited about, uh, is we're working on a management training, which we have done in the past as well, um, in collaboration with the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We're hoping to really revamp this next year. And so this is also a plug. Um, whatever capacity you work in, in nightlife, if you are interested in talking about like what management can and should be doing in order to better respond to the needs of their staff and also to prevent harm from happening in their spaces. We're going to be developing a management and owner specific training. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to be working with a working group. So we want managers, owners, but then also people who are not managers and owners. So bar staff, bar back servers, 
um, to really come together and talk about like what policies are actually practical to suggest to a manager or owner that would protect their workers. Um, what kind of limitations do you have as a mandated reporter or as an owner when you're, you know, trying to also make money? So that's all that kind of stuff that we want to cover in the management training. Um, and again, you will have the opportunity to read all our information at the end so you can figure out how to get in contact with us to bring any or all of these to your spaces. Okay, Amy. Okay, I think our chat is live. And um, so this is so weird not being able to see the people who are here. <laughs> um, but we would love to hear from you all. What causes violence? This is this. What are the things that that lead to someone being violent? You can just drop this in the chat. We'll give a couple seconds here for to get some answers. And this can be things that you either believe might cause violence or things that uh, you've heard people say if you know you've seen things happen and and oh it was just this or you know culturally what are things that we this is all great yep excessive alcohol use too much to drink rape culture drugs hurt people hurt people so you're speaking to like trauma right trauma can cause it what else relationship problems for sure hey nina vicious i see you anything else here Sexual entitlement. Yep. Oops, sorry, I've just lost that last one. Hate to marginalize groups. Okay, so I'm going to pop up the next slide here. These are the common answers that we hear when we're doing these trainings. Um, oop, we have more. Good. Yes. Gender roles, racism, homophobia, transphobia. Yes. All right. So common answers for like, oh, this is, I'm sorry, I just like this happened, right? Anger, jealousy cheating, stress. Eric, why does that have a money symbol on it? We have a money symbol because sixth graders told me that number one, that money is the biggest cause of stress. So I'm going to spell like that forever. For the rest of time. That's that's how we spell stress. Uh, previous exposure to violence, some of you spoke to that. So like trauma, lack of or poor communication, alcohol, other drugs, um, mental illness, you see this a bunch with um, the cultural conversation around mass violence and mass shootings, that it's a mental illness issue. Uh, they provoked me, right? Anger kind of like I was poked, I was poked, I was poked, or I just lost control. So these are sort of the common answers that we hear um, to what things that cause violence. And I am here to tell you that that is none of them are true. <laughs> none of these are the things that cause violence because if they were the things that cause violence, it would cause violence in everyone, right? When all of us got drunk, we would have absolutely no choice but to hulk out and punch the person next to us. I know that when I get drunk, Eric loves to say when he gets drunk, he gets loud and he buys everybody food. I just like to cry. I just cry a lot. Um, so what actually is contributing to violence or these are the main contributing factors um, our belief systems, it's your value systems. It's, it's the values that you hold either from your family of origin or your culture of origin or the culturalization of like, so some of you touched about stuff like this in the chat, but some of the examples of attitudes and beliefs, value systems that contribute to violence. Some of the things we discussed earlier can be triggers, but the things that are actually causing them are these value systems. The idea that violence solves problems, uh, rigid gender roles, power and control, right to sex, entitlement to sex. We get into this very specifically because we reject the idea that alcohol causes sexual assault um, and, and the inherent demonization of nightlife spaces being a place that are places that are dangerous and that it's alcohol service or that it's nightlife or that it's counterculture or that's any of these things that are inherently violent or inherently dangerous and recognize that this is coming from a deeper place and that alcohol is not the problem. Yes. Thank you so much, Amy, for leading us through that. Um, yeah. All right. I'm going to take And Eric just put it. Sorry, I'm just going to say it. So make sure everybody say it because it's so good. Alcohol does not cause sexual assault. No specialist who understands the issue would believe that. Mm. That's a really yeah. important. I just wanted to amplify that. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, for real. And this is a huge part of our workshops, too, is, is having conversations with staff about like, because also, you know, this might not be something that you talk about in nightlife space often, like what causes sexual violence and like, 
really we want to bring people into the prevention world and the the world that you know Eric and I exist in of like sexual assault prevention to see that like really that can't be that can be happening in nightlife spaces um and we don't want to like villainize spaces that serve alcohol because those are also spaces of a lot of joy and like fun and community building and we love nightlife um so okay i also am have we for whatever reason having trouble seeing the chat so give me like 30 seconds i'm gonna just do this really quickly and make sure that it's back for me okay okay i still can't see it i don't know why i don't know why my zoom is being like this but i'm just gonna trust amy and eric to yeah we'll stay on it you're good okay because we're about to play the f game <gasps> and, yeah i know um also i love eric <laughs> presenting this with your little bitmoji man's here. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> um, and I love that we just keep it in like, all, <laughs> like I've never it's been, been there like, forever. We've, yeah, we've I've never been like, I should remove that. Like, it's just like, yeah, obviously we're gonna have Eric vibing here. Um, anyway, so we're gonna play a little game now that we do during all of our workshops is how we often kick them off. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different because we're doing it on Zoom. We, we typically do workshops in person, but it'll still work. So everyone get your, thinking brains ready because I'm going to show you a sentence and all you have to do is count the number of F's in that sentence and don't put it in the chat yet. Just wait like 30 seconds. Um, just count the F's and keep it to yourself. We'll give people like, you know, 30, 40 seconds, minute. Hold up, hold up, hold your, hold your answers, y'all. Give us like 10 more seconds. They're jumping on us, Scarlett, they're ready. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, give, once people, we'll get, yeah, 10 more seconds. And then everyone, cause we don't want people to steal each other's answers. Don't be sneaky. I feel so strange not being able to see the chat. I, I promise I'm typically really good at Zoom, but I also just like want to keep our flow going. So I'm not going to try to correct this right now, but. Okay, okay, Scarlett, go back to the other one so we lose the sentence so we don't see it anymore. Okay, yes, perfect. Wait, oh yeah, okay. Uh, everyone send in the chat now. How many Fs? And Eric and Amy, will one of you read off what we're getting? Okay, I'm seeing nine, nine, six, six, eight, nine, six. Brilliant. I love this. Anybody else? At nine. Okay, All right. so we have some sixes, we have some eights, and we have some nines. Perfect. So the correct answer is nine. <gasps> what? No. <laughs> what? How? Okay. So now those who said maybe six, seven, eight, whatever, anything other than nine, take a look at the sentence again. What did you miss? And send it in the chat. What someone, are we getting? Someone says they missed the first O. Okay. Did I'm assuming we, uh, for those who also said maybe six, seven, eight, I'm assuming we kind of missed the ofs. Um, so what makes it easy to, to miss the ofs? Like, why did we miss them? And send it in the chat. Again, I can't see it, but my besties are looking. I'll read you. Don't worry. You're good. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about why did we miss the ofs? I think the other thing people will often miss is the double Fs, the things, the Fs that are together, but why do we miss that stuff? Not seeing any answers yet. We'll give it a couple more seconds and then we'll just, uh, <laughs> short word, last letter. Yep. This is so crazy. Cause I literally scanned the sentence like seven times. <laughs> I still am like every time I've been we use this for years and I'm like wait how many is it yeah. when I said nine I was kind of unsure I was winging it <laughs> I, think, I think it's nine uh, okay oh I see I see the numbers in the chat going up I think because it's not considered a real word Oof. Oof. Ooh. pin it pin it <laughs> mm, yeah that's good yeah so Thank you all for these answers because this is exactly what, you know, started it. Yep. Yep. Brilliant. We were hoping you'd share. Um, so the reason why we do this activity is because it's a great illustration of what we at 
outsmart in all of our work try to focus on, which is the of moments. So when we talk about sexual violence and harm, identity-based harm, gender-based harm, all these horrible things that happen, when we talk about preventing them at the early steps, what we really want to be looking at is those moments that get glossed over or that are really easy because they're commonplace. They happen all the time. Uh, it's a joke. It's something that, you know, you've been hearing since you were five. So it doesn't really feel like something worth intervening in. Um, so we're talking about like all different forms of harm too. And not just like, you know, maybe seeing a cis white man, like putting his hand on like a younger cis white girl. Like we are talking about like misgendering someone, uh, racist microaggressions, um, any form of like leering, looking, um, somebody making a passive comment about someone's body, like things that can be really hard to intervene in, but that actually are those building blocks for larger harms. So those are what we call the of moments. And those are what we really like to focus on in these trainings, because we also know a lot of those happen in everyday life. Um, do you, either of you have anything to add about the of moments before we go on to bystander tips? I'll say one of the benefits of our focus on those of moments that are easy to miss and don't really fit what we often think of as like the physical violence intervening is that there are more of those opportunities happening in any given night. And those are safer opportunities where you can intervene with a small ass intervention and reduce the likelihood of escalation to physical harm, right? We see it all the time and we're gonna get into that. And I'll just add, Scarlett, you're talking sort of about like the of moments culturally that we overlook because they're normalized. Um, for me, this is also about the of moments that are industry specific, right? That this is our opportunity to sort of look at the things I mentioned earlier, like, well, we don't get to have that. That just doesn't apply to us. That doesn't count here. Um, and the stuff that we've sort of normalized under the umbrella of tip culture, under the umbrella of like the customer is always right. There are things that are really, really industry specific um, that compound the cultural messaging that makes it things that we either don't see, we don't notice, or we don't think matter, or we don't think count, or we don't think we get to want better or different than. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. enjoy the notion of small ass interventions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I actually was also notice, noting that. I, I love like, a small ass intervention. Small ass <laughs> interventions. I kind of love that. <laughs> we'll be using that in the future, putting it on the slides. Yeah. Uh, Brie, you just said this beautifully. Normalization of harmful behavior desensitizes us to noticing it. Exactly. So yep. these are moments to, think, to, to take a step back and be like, what have we gotten really used to that actually might be the places that we can intervene and we can start to shift things so that the really big, scary, put your cape on, um, uh, escalated ones don't actually happen. Yeah, absolutely. Segway? Yeah. Small call? Let's do it. Here we are. All right, so, uh, Amy and I are going to tag team these. These are some of the bystander interventions we would go through with you in a training and also role play with you because we know we got to do some role play. Um, and so you might have different words, different language you use, other folks use different ones, but these are the ones that we often share to start this conversation. And for us, our first bystander tip is a check-in. Y'all, I love check-ins because check-ins you can do before harm. You can do it uh, during a situation that feels uncomfortable. You could also do it after something harmful has happened to see what someone might need. Um, and so these can be small things like what I learned from Amy. You see, two couple, you see a couple that you think is uncomfortable and you go, hey, how you doing? What brings you here tonight? while you're pouring your glass of water, right? And maybe you find out they're having a political conversation. You're like, I need to stay the hell out of that. Maybe you find out they're on their first Tinder date. Maybe when you say, hey, how you doing? What brings you here tonight? You get the sense from one of the folks that, oh my gosh, please stay here, help me. Or maybe you sense that one person is a lot more drunk than another, right? It, 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 you're not making any kind of accusation. You're being a hospitable host. You're just asking a question to help you understand, do I need to keep an eye on this? Do I need to, am I anticipating that there's going to be some kind of intervention here? And while you're pouring that glass of water, you're increasing the chances that one person's going to have to go to the bathroom eventually so that you can do a one-on-one -on -one intervention in the next 20, 30 minutes, right? So it's just something like, hey, what brings you here tonight? Are you okay? What's going on? How are you? And again, you're not making an accusation. You're just, uh, you know, inquiring. And then using your observation skills, your safe, your, your tips training skills, right? To help you make a better assessment and give you time to get more help if you need it. 
Um, I love this. Just to add to it too, check in, like you do this already. Everybody on the floor does this already. This is what we're doing. This is just us checking in on how's your food? How's your, how's the drinks? How's everything? And it is a chance to take in body language. It's a chance to take in tone of voice. It's a chance to be a presence. Um, and sometimes just your presence is an act of bystander intervention. Sometimes your literal being a little bit nosy or a little bit over attentive is an act of, of people saying, all right, this staff is on top of it. This is not a place that I can get away with anything. They are, they're here and they're present. Um, I also just want to go back really quickly and say, bystander intervention really does, can, it feels hot, right? Like it feels like, oh, you are asking to like, get in there and put your gloves on, put your cape on. For the most part, what we talk about is the ways that you are doing interventions no one will ever notice. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you do have to step in, you have to say something. But in so many cases, particularly in our work, it's it's so subtle and it's so small that it doesn't actually escalate anything and people don't realize it's happened. So let's get into some of those examples here. Um, what was that one? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It was, oh wait, oh my God, distraction. Okay, distract. <laughs> uh, okay, so distraction is just, <laughs> Eric tells this great example. Do you want to do the, your, yours here that you did once? Yeah, I mean, I was training a brewery, y'all, and the security team brought this, he was just like, we were rolling, he's like, oh my God, your Escalade's on fire. And it was so ridiculous as a nonprofit worker who has a capped wage <laughs> like for someone to say something like that to me. I realized how ridiculous it was. And then in that moment, I realized, oh, my God, this bystander intervention trick worked. It got someone in my face. I know that they see me. And it was just something like stupid, <laughs> you know, a weird ass question. <laughs> this is something, you know, I noticed some, somebody in the bar who's like reading a book and wants to kind of be left alone. And the person next to them is insisting on conversation. Maybe I'm in a position where with that person, I'm a little safer that I can go over to the person who's being a little aggressive and engage them in a conversation. Or maybe I can engage the other person in a conversation. I love this shirt. Where did you get that? And in that, like, you, I'm, you're on Zoom here, but we can like do the eye contact thing and get the like, you good? You okay? Yeah. Okay. I can tell that I need more information here. I need more. I need to find out more. Or I totally misread this. This is fine. They're great. I can step away. Speak up. Uh, this one can sometimes give folks nerves. So at Outsmart, we like to think of this as a uh, as multiple options for speaking up. Speaking up can be like, hey, leave them alone. Cut it out. I don't think this is appropriate. Speaking up can also mean, especially for folks who are afraid or not confrontational like me, speaking up to get help. <laughs> speaking up yeah. to a coworker who I know is good at intervening in this type of situation. But if you've never talked to your coworkers about what their style of intervention is, you won't know. It's speaking up to management. We just talked to a venue that does like a voice of God thing and we'll get on the air and be like, hey, we see you, you're on camera, cut it out. <laughs> right? So like speaking up doesn't have to be you putting yourself in the middle of something. It can be you speaking up to your team or other people who can help and make you feel more confident in the intervention but you need ways to communicate with your staff to do that too. This can also be naming the thing that's happening, right? So Eric mentioned earlier in the check-in um, and getting people uh, hydrated enough, they have to pee. I'm a big fan of the like, once they're separated and something I've been kind of watching and I'm a little anxious about going to the person I'm worried about and being like, hey, I do not mean to overstep and I'm so sorry if I'm misreading this, but like, I've just heard a couple of things that your data is saying and like, are you good? You seem a little like, a little bit and the way that trauma often works is in our bodies is that like just having another person reflect back to you like hey i see you and i see this and it's a little messed up is enough for somebody to go right and i've seen that happen so many times that just being seen speaking it to that person is enough to make them go oh my gosh you're so right yeah i've been in sort of trauma mode i've been in just manage this don't escalate it i'm sure it's fine and having it reflected back to them is enough for them to get themselves out of the situation and say this, yeah, the state is over. Like, you're absolutely right. This, this wasn't feeling good. Next. Okay. This one's excellent. Separating. Again, no one's going to know this is happening. Sometimes they do, but this can be, excuse me, I just need to get through here. Bus tubs, huge, like great intervention. Uh, or passing a tray through. This is a place we'll get really venue specific with you. We'll come in and we'll look at your space. And are you working with a dance floor? Do you have a DJ on certain nights? 
Um, what's the makeup of where your service bar is versus where your patrons cross to go to the bathroom? Like, where are the places that you can actually separate people? Also be like, um, somebody goes to the, the bathroom, you check in and the person's like, yeah, I'm a little bit, I'm, I just want to be left alone. And you go, great friend who's visiting me at the bar or regular that I know is down. Can you come sit next to this person? And I'll just move them to your, this, the person that's making them uncomfortable to a different seat. And then you say to the person that's making them uncomfortable, sorry, their friend just joined. Do you mind if I move you over here? No one has any idea that they've made someone uncomfortable. This is not necessarily a situation that needs to be fully escalated to like get out. You've done something wrong, but we pre we prevented in that little of moment here. I'll also say we've seen some really creative stuff. Uh, friends and lovers, they do a thing where they have flashlights and we noticed and in darker spaces, when someone sees a light flash, it sometimes makes them think authority. But friends and lovers, they'll flash it on the ground for just a quick second, and the cockroaches uh, scatter. <laughs> this stuff just like stops because people think like there's light. Even things like turning up the lights, right? It's a great way to just disrupt the moment. But in terms of separation, yeah, something as simple as bringing a bus tote, walking through people, in between people, excuse me, gotta get through if you have roamers or security, or simply t flashing a flashlight on the ground, which makes people stop and be like, oh shit, <laughs> right? Creative ways to do it. Um, we have, we have DJs that will turn the lights up and, and have like, and keep the vibe going, right? And just be like, this is a totally normal, lights are up, everybody good, check in. Does the person you're dancing with want to be dancing with you. All right, let's go back. And if people want to come back together, they can. But if they didn't want to be there, it gives them an opportunity to scurry themselves out. And so the next one is remove. This one is sort of like separate. It can be a direct one. Yo, this person needs to go. Like they violate our policies, consent violation, whatever it is, they're out. But again, just like with speak up, we know folks might not feel comfortable doing it directly. So you can speak up and get help. Hey, security. Hey, management. Hey, uh, you know, uh, server, whoever it is on your team who is uh, available or who you think can be helpful, you can get their help in um, removing this person from the situation. Even if it's another staff member, like Amy was just saying like this was separate, like if one staff person is being like harassed and you see it, hey, Mike wants you in the back. Mike doesn't want you in the back. I'm just getting you out of this situation. Mike and, doesn't even work here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this can also be enlisting the help of the sober friend, right? Like if it's, again, not a situation that you feel comfortable getting a bouncer or you feel comfortable, or maybe you don't have security at your venue, that you have a relation, you know, you feel like there is one friend in the group that you're like, your buddy's being a problem. You got to get him out. Help me get him out. Can you help me out? Um, I had something else I was going to add to that. And now it's gone from my brain. Don't know. Carry on. All right, support. Um, again, this is where Eric is saying that um, you can intervene before, during, and after something. Uh, we recognize that we need to bridge the gap between prevention and the crisis. Things are going to happen. Things are absolutely going to happen. Um, and you know, we we very much recognize that that doing these trainings and talking about these things it's stressful, right? Because it's like, well, okay, go forth and prevent anything bad ever from happening in your venue. Um, and we'll talk really in depth about like what the makeup of your staff is and and having training them to talk to each other about like whose lived experience, whose identity is actually the safest person to intervene here. Um, and you're not expected to intervene at all times. Things are gonna happen in your venue. It's important you keep yourself safe too. And so much of what you can do is support after, is be there to offer um, validation and belief and, uh, what do you need? One of the big things we'll talk about is uh, letting someone who has just experienced harm lead the way, immediately giving them their autonomy back to them by not telling them what to do, by not uh, making choices for what the best thing is for them, what they would like to see happen. This is why a lot of these bystander tips can be helpful because a lot of times people who are in a sticky situation don't want the kind of like hero intervention that would actually escalate things. Maybe this person has to go back to work with that person the next week, or they live with them, or you know, dynamics are complicated. So, what do you need to see happen here? If you, if you have, what what would you like? What would support look like for you here? What do you want me to do next? And obviously, we do recognize and and we talk about this more in depth in our management training. But that there are some liabilities, and there are you know some some restaurants use mandated reporting and. 
Um, but, but as much as you can offer autonomy back to a survivor of any kind, um, the faster that they will be able to, to start healing um, and letting them lead the way towards what happens. And support can also look like connecting people to us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both for those bystander tips. And again, this is just like a little bit of what we do in a work, like in a workshop, we will be talking to your staff. Like, how do you see this happening in your space? Like, how have you done this before? Um, so this is a little teaser for you all. Um, 10 minutes left. We're actually kind of nailing it with the timing, if I do say so myself. Um, so this is actually just piggybacking right on what Amy was just talking about, which is classic. I know, I know. <laughs> when, sorry. No, it's okay. No, no, no. This is good. That was great. Um, because now we're gonna go into just a few tips that I think are really helpful to keep in mind when if and when you do hear a disclosure. So as Amy was saying, like we know that harm happens. That's not, we can't expect it to never happen. And we also know a lot of you probably have responded to harm before and done it probably in a great way. And like, you know, as compassionate people and we're not all trained in like how to respond to somebody telling us that they've been sexually assaulted or sexually harassed. And it can be a really difficult thing for the person who's offering support. So these are just like a few basic things that we tell people to keep in mind after they hear disclosures um, that we also have a lot of resources that we're going to give you in addition to this. So one of the main things that we like to open with is just thanking someone for sharing with you, like literally just a thank you so much for trusting me with that, or I appreciate you bringing that to me um, and acknowledging that it, it might've been hard, especially if we're talking, if you are a manager and an employee brings something to you, like validating that that could may not have been easy, like just really showing gratitude for somebody sharing something with you rather than, of course, what we want to avoid is like making something feel like they're bringing you a problem or like they're bringing you something that you now have to deal with. Instead, we want it to feel like, you know, well, I'm here to support you. Um, and also, even if you are a coworker who heard a disclosure from another coworker, again, just saying like, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, naming your limitations. So one thing also that we talk about with trauma response is like, we don't wanna promise anything that we can't guarantee will happen. So one of our, I, and I am guilty of this. Our impulse can be to say, everything's going to be okay. Like I'm going to take care of it. It's going to be all right. And it's so hard, but we cannot actually guarantee somebody that everything is going to happen, maybe in the exact way that they want it to happen. Um, so instead, you know, maybe saying something like, I'm going to do everything I can to support you, everything in my power to support you, but not promising that they're going to get some specific result or anything like that. Um, beyond that, again, if you're a mandated reporter, sharing that and within that comes a lot of feelings can come up for somebody who's a survivor, especially if, you know, you mentioned the police because not everybody feels safe around the police. And if you are going to be reporting or if you are going to be taking certain steps, explaining everything that you're going to be doing and everything that that person will be like everyone who they'll be hearing from what they have to share what they don't have to share just making someone feel like they know what's going on so important um and then along with that as and we have mentioned this several times now giving them choice and power and when we talk about giving someone power we're one when you know we experience trauma or harm the core of that is we have power taken away from us so this is why we do that here, but also giving someone options. So saying, instead of just saying like, all right, what's next? Like saying to them, because when, when we experience trauma, our brains often are not going to know exactly what we need in that moment. And it can be really helpful to actually hear like a list. Like I can connect you with someone on the outsmart team. I can connect you with an advocate. We can call a crisis hotline, give them a menu and that will make it so much easier for them to make a decision about what they need next. Finally, follow up plan. Like just say, I'm going to check in with you tomorrow. Or is it okay if I send you a text later tonight? Because often when we disclose, it can feel really, really vulnerable, really like raw. And then 
we're just kind of tossed in back into our lives. So knowing that someone is, is thinking about you and is going to follow up can also really help. Um, okay. And two quick examples from our outsmart team. Um, one of you feel free to jump in. Yeah. I mean, so I'll share a quick example of an off moment for us where we were able to help after an incident. We were working with a restaurant that served alcohol and one of the chefs um, had sexually harassed one of the, the servers. Um, the management team found this out, they admitted to it, and then they wrote up the chef. The chef ended up uh, leaving. Then they talked to the, the person who was sexually harassed. The person who was sexually harassed, yes, the venue did what was compliant within their policy protocol, but the survivor felt like power had been taken away from them. Like a bunch of things had been happening, steps had been taken that they hadn't been informed of, they felt awkward at the workplace, felt like people were going to be talking about them because others knew about the situation and that it was reported before the survivor did. That survivor, nothing bad happened to them, but the feeling of having the power take away from them led to them quitting that place. And so for us, our conversation, we had a really simple solution. When you have harassment or harm that happens, talk to the person who was harmed first, right? That's something that's not going to like necessarily like uh, mess with like compliance or anything like that. But it does allow you to just be up front with the person who we think was harmed. It gives an opportunity to say, hey, actually, that didn't happen. Or, hey, actually, like, it wasn't that bad. Like, I don't think it was, like, a problem. But it also informs them, like Carl Scarlett saying, of what their options are what can happen next, how they might want to address the situation. And it can give you an opportunity to ease some of their anxieties and let them know, hey, this is confidential, like under the law. We can't be talking about it to everyone so to help ease that anxiety about feeling awkward and everything. So that's just one example of a super small moment where we're able to help uh, a, a venue um, just make a small shift in policy to be more trauma informed. That also allows the person there to be like, look, I don't want them to get in trouble. I don't want them to get fired. I just want to go back to work. I just want maybe a conversation with them. Um, and that's where your managers go, cool, let's connect you to Outsmart. They have, they can connect you to mediation services. Everybody can get back to work. Everybody can, can kind of have a more restorative approach to these things if that's what the survivor wants to see happen. The other version of this that I wanted to share is uh, very typical, like got a call from a, a, a relationship owner that we love. Um, where something had happened at their venue, where they had gotten an email from a, a patron and, and who described a situation that they had experienced something bad. And we just helped them with the language of how to respond. So we got on the phone with them. What does your crew need? What, like, what does your staff need to feel okay about this? And how do you respond to this person in a way that is within your liability? Um, and also, you know, says to the person, like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Is there, what would you like us to see? What would you like to see done here? Um, while naming the limitations of what they can actually do and how do we make you feel safe to come back here again in a really authentic way and in an actual survivor way and not a like, just come back and we'll buy you a drink. Like <laughs> that, it, that it was allowed them to feel like a member of their community as opposed to, oh no, we don't wanna lose that person's money. So we worked with them to sort of figure out the language of the email that went out to this to the survivor in that case. Yeah. Thank you, Amy and Eric. Um, I'm just gonna, I also wanna be mindful of time now. I know I was like, we're amazing, but it's now 2.58. Um, so I'm just gonna flash this quickly and then I'm gonna put it back up during the Q&A if that's cool, because these are all just support resources that you all can take a picture of if you want. Um, but I do wanna give Amy a moment to talk about how you can get involved and then we'll do Q&A and show the resources. Am I in charge of involved? Okay, I love it. Um, call us, email us, let's talk. Uh, our stuff here is here. Also, screenshot this if you'd like. Um, you can request a training for your venue. That's on our website. There's a link to a little form that will come to us. Um, you can become a facilitator. We are always particularly looking for nightlife facilitators. Our team of facilitators are made up of one of Eric and Scarlett, one of me, and a crisis responder, an advocate in the room to provide support. Um, and we would love to have you come facilitate trainings with us. Um, you can sign up for our list serve. That's where you'll see events. We do parties, we do events, we do collective meetings. Um, collective meetings are where, you know, nightlife folks all get together and sort of talk about like, how's it going in your venue? What was something you dealt with this month? Like, um, and we always buy the first round of drinks for those. Uh, you can join our policy and management working group. As Scarlett mentioned, you do not need to be a manager. This is very much us trying to bridge the gap between what does your front of house staff need your managers to know about what support looks like? 
and what do the managers need the team to know about what their limitations are in doing so. Um, or reach out if you want to host an event or collaborate on an event or a campaign. We do all sorts of just one-off fundraising um, or awareness campaigns in all kinds of venues. So we would love to talk to you if you have an idea for one of those. Yay. Thank you, Amy. And now Q&A time, but I'm also going to leave this up. Um, these are great resources that Eric put together. Eric, do you want to say anything about these? Yeah, I mean, check in on them. You can take a picture of this. I also put it in the chat. Um, among these resources are like three different resource directories that just give you access to a bunch of other resources beyond like trauma, sexual assault, you'll get benefits, um, hospital stuff. So oftentimes we tell folks like the thing you can do if you can't say I believe you as a manager is give them these resources because that's going to send them to someone like us who can say I believe you. And that's going to make you look good as a manager and look you look more supportive. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So yeah, we're opening it up now to any questions that you all have, feedback, thoughts, I, in, I don't know, dreams. Um, but if you don't have any, you're also, of course, welcome to hop off this uh, little webinar. But we really, really appreciate you all being here. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Yeah, we'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions or thoughts. Um, also, if you don't feel comfortable shooting them in the chat, email us, but we're happy to talk or jump on a call or whatever after. I also just sent in the chat um, the a wonderful resource that Eric worked on. That is a resource guide for managers, owners who hear disclosures or how to respond to harm. Um, it's amazing. And yes, I believe recordings will be available of this. Yeah, we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar um, that, uh, you know, anyone uh, will be able to share with uh, others they know in the industry. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you so, so much, Eric and Amy and Scarlett. And uh, thank you, everyone else, for coming and contributing to this conversation. I think we always learn so much from you all about how each of us can identify and, you know, really step up in some challenging situations. So um, we hope everyone who attended will be able to use these important tactics to help make your spaces safer for everyone. And we really do encourage you all to reach out directly to Outsmart and schedule a training, make sure your staff and colleagues can get that really in-depth experience. Um, as always, everyone's welcome to reach out directly to us at the Office of Nightlife, uh, our email address, nightlifeofmedianyc dot gov or our social media accounts at nyc nightlife gov um, just want to add that we'll also be um, hosting our, our next webinar as part of our night school series this thursday december 8th at 12 30 in the afternoon about our mend nyc mediation program um, so that's if you are having a quality of life related issue at your venue with a neighbor uh, you're invited to come learn about how this free program can help uh, resolve those conflicts. So we'll leave the meeting open for another couple of minutes. So you can grab any links or other information in the chat and we can respond to additional questions as well. So thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Amy, do you see the question in the Q&A? You got a question. Hey, Paul. Sorry. Um, where is it? I don't see it. I can I can read it. It's just it's asking you about in your experience with with nightlife, how frequently you experience incidents like in the venues that you work in. I think that well, I really don't see this question. Um, there's a Q&A. Do you see Q&A? Oh, yeah. in the chat. I see. Um, OK, I think that you have to really specifically clarify like what an incident means there, like what I mean, every single day and interventions are happening every single shift I was on, on something, you know, we, we, I, my eyes were peeled and we're doing little tiny things here in terms of like noticeable in interventions, noticeable incidents where um, maybe there had to be a, a more extravagant intervention, obviously rare, um, but it really depends on the venue too. I've, I've worked, you know, rooftop, rooftop club places. I've done more, um, you know, swanky restaurant steakhouse kind of vibes uh and they all have they all have different i guess levels or types of of incidents um it's hard to put a number on it 
but yeah. Also certain times of year, you know, there's interesting data on like what nights uh, are worse for hospitals, for reporters. There's, you know, there's a reason we all hate Santa Con. <laughs> yep. but, so and Halloween. And, and holidays are always really, you know, you definitely are noticing an uptick in um, domestic violence behaviors in our venues around around holidays. I think that's always, it's always like a tension um, at that time of year. So Halloween, end of year holidays, things like that. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Please feel free to add more to it. That was pretty thorough. One of those. Yeah. Let me not answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, folks, feel free if, if you have more, feel free to send them. I see we still have some participants here. So we are here. Also, if you have things that you're like, I don't want to ask this like on a public webinar, you can also, you know, shoot us an email or talk to us if you have anything you want to talk through. Or private message, and we can always ask it. True. Anonymously. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty of of Zoom, I must say. Yeah. Oh, I think we got another question. Uh, gotta go. See, <laughs> gotta, gotta go, go. See you on Thursday. <laughs> I mean, we can take your gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got thank you. Hey, Joe Simon, y'all. Joe is an OG doing engaging men work like across the country, the world. Yes. No, awesome. I was in college. So good. On me for life, bro. On me for life. <laughs> all right. I think we're going to uh, call this a day. And uh, thank you all so much for, for being with us. And um, thanks to uh, Sarah from uh, the New York City Commission on Gender Equity as well. Uh, for sharing information about the uh, 16 days campaign so everyone go check that out and um, hopefully we'll see some of you back on Thursday for our uh, MEND NYC mediation webinar so have a great day everyone thank you yeah thank you bye y'all